So I was reflecting earlier today on the beautiful flowers for the, for the celebration of marriage. And I was thinking after a trip to Sam's last night with my wife that probably that's the ultimate test of any marriage. <laughs> Usually our trip to Sam begins with, I thought we were only coming for one thing. And then it goes to, well, let's look at all the stuff here. Then do we really need that? And then she says, I don't think you are going to go with me anymore. <laughs> Congratulations again to Keenan and Star and to, to uh, Frank and Beth. So, five weeks ago, we been, began this message series on the story of the life of Joseph. Exodus 37 to, I mean, excuse me, Genesis 37 uh, to Genesis chapter 50. Five weeks in this beautiful and amazing story. And the beautiful thing about the story is it's so incredibly relevant. Not, do you learn, not only do you learn how to live your life in the midst of adversity, difficulty, and hardship from following Joseph's example and his character, but we also learn about who God is. God's unfailing love for us and for our world and the way that God is always at work in the world. And if you're here today, maybe for the first time, you can go back on our website or YouTube channel and you can uh, check in the other sermons on the, ser- on the life of Joseph. And we hope you'll always take those messages and then um, share them with other people to let them know about our church and maybe somebody else will find that to be positive. So today, as we, we wrap up the story, and before I dig into the real heart of the message, what, what God is saying to me about wrapping this story up today, is I thought it'd be helpful to take a few takeaways as a reminder about where we've been. The first thing and the most important thing we take away from this story is it just declares to us that it doesn't matter where you are in life, no matter what circumstance you find yourself in, good times, hard times, God is always there with you that you're not alone. Uh, This story just underlines and underscores the truth about the character of God's presence in the midst of adversity. We see it in his life. From his entire life, we see his entire life in this story, from when he was a teenager all the way to his death, and we see how the Lord was with him, giving him strength, encouragement in the midst of his adversity. It says time and again, that the Lord was with Joseph, with him in prison, with him when he was in the pit, with him when he was a slave, and with him when he was in the Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's home. And so wherever you find yourself in life, whatever pit you find yourself in, this is a reminder of God's abiding, unfailing love in the midst of our adversity and our darkness. Because our God is a strength in times of trouble. And our God walks with us through the deepest and darkest valleys. Amen? Amen. The second thing we learn from the story is the value and the importance of forgiveness and mercy. Joseph was born into an extremely dysfunctional family. He was hated and despised by his brothers thrown into a pit, and sold to human traffickers. And Joseph, at this moment in his life, at the ending, at some point in his life, when his brothers return and he meets them face to face, he has all the power to get even with them, to take out his full, full retribution on them. But instead he chooses mercy and forgiveness. And we see in his story... We see how that forgiveness and mercy was not something that just came up automatically. It took place over 30 years of him working through the pain and the struggle and the sorrow. But we also see the value of a reconciled family. And so this story reminds us of the importance of forgiveness for me and for you and for our lives and for our families and not holding on to resentment, but also reminds us of the danger the extreme danger of rooting our identities, rooting our identities in our grievances and in our resentments. And the longer you live in that pit of resentment, 
the harder it will be, the harder it will be for you to climb out of that pit. The third thing is we learn about the faithfulness and, te- and integrity of Joseph. It doesn't matter what he faced. It doesn't matter what his trials were. Whether he was in prison or a slave, he was falsely accused and tempted. But in every single moment, his faithfulness and his integrity did not waver. He was steadfast in his values and his commitment to be the person that God was calling him to be. His life and how he responded was not dictated by what other people did around him. And you know and I know that there's a lot in life that we have no control over. You have no control over the way people treat you. You have no control over a lot of the things that happen in our world. But there's one thing that can never be taken away from you. It's your choice, the power of choice in how you respond in every moment in your life to the circumstances that you're in. And this reminds us the importance of character, the importance of grit and not giving up and refusing to quit, refusing to let others define us into living our very best life, the life that God has in mind for us, to be people of faithfulness and integrity. But what we also learn in this story is we learn something about the character of God, what God is like. Because the story is really God's story, not Joseph's story, how God is at work in the story. And what we learn here, and this is the word God put on my heart, that God is relentless. Say it to somebody beside you. Say, God is relentless. Help me out. Say, God is relentless. God never gives up. God, one way or another, is going to redeem the world and make the world new and bring God's grace and love to the world no matter what we do to one another or what we do to our creation because this world does belong to God. And we see it in the story. The story is bigger than Joseph. It's about God's plan to redeem the world. God chose Abraham and blessed him and said, you're going to be a blessing to the nations. And that dream was then passed on to to Isaac, to Jacob, and then to Joseph. And every step along the way, it looks like the dream's going to come to an end. But God finds a way to work through imperfect people and through imperfect circumstances because God is always working, because God is always at work. And we see over and over again how God works behind the scenes and chooses sometimes the most unlikely people. Now, we did read chapter 38 in the story. It's right in the middle of the story. And for good reason. I mean, actually, to make a little confession, I was going to preach that part of the story on Father's Day. And I was sharing with our small group that I was going to preach the story on Father's Day. And one of them said, do you know it's Father's Day? Because it's about the worst father ever in the Bible, almost. It's about a terrible dad in the story. One of Joseph's brothers And so I decided not to preach on it, and I punted the story because I enjoy working here. (laughs) But basically, it's about a woman who has no power at all, and she's just passed down from one brother to another, and she ends up fathering a child with her father-in-law. And it's a story about a woman who has to make decisions and choices, who has no power for her own survival. It's really... One of those stories, if you were to read it in the Bible, you'd want your kids to go like this. Because it's, it's just, and who says the Bible's boring? I mean, it is, it is an R-rated story. It's a story of epic magnitude of scandal and abuse and trouble and trauma. And you would think, this story should be forgotten, sort of erased from the Bible, not even there, and, and that these people would be forgotten. But you know what you get the big surprise with? You flip over a few pages in the Bible, you get to the Gospel of Matthew, and you know what you find out? That father-in-law Judah, that daughter-in-law Tamar, and that little boy born from that relationship are in the genealogy of Jesus. Now think about that. Think about what that means. God can use anyone at any time, in any place, who says, here I am, use me. 
It means that God is not scared of you, not scared of your past. Your past does not disqualify you for showing up and going to work for God in the world. Because when you give your life to Jesus Christ, all the past becomes just the past. In fact, God can even use your past to bring life. Your past does not disqualify you to work for God. In fact, sometimes the things that hurt and harm us are the very things that form us and shape us from work. Now, I realize that for some of you, that's bad news. And the reason it's bad news is because it's easier to not do anything, and it's scary because you can't be a victim anymore. Scripture will not allow you to be a victim. This is my life, and this is what's happened to me. I have no choice because when you read Scripture, we realize that we are empowered by God to get up, to get involved, and to be active in the world, and that our past is not an excuse from being a loving, caring human being. And when you read this story, it is kind of scary because it means that as God's, we are the church of Jesus Christ. We've been put in this world for mission and for purpose. And that means you've got to be uncomfortable. You've got to be willing to take risks. The church just can't hide in a building behind stained glass while the world around us suffers and struggles. You see, this God is relentless. And we see it in the story. Now, back to the story. Do you know what happens? It was a happy ending until it wasn't. You see, in Genesis, at the end of Genesis, we found out, we find out that his brothers, they had lived together for many years, reconciled in the land of Goshen. They'd shown up on Joseph's doorsteps and he forgave them and gave them a beautiful land and their families grew and multiplied. They had children and more and more children. It says that Joseph lived to be 110 years old. Herb, he's got 10 years on you. And he saw his grandchildren born, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. He was able to look at his life. He had a full and beautiful life, a rag-to-riches story. At 110, he looks at his brothers and he says, Brothers, I'm going to die, but I want to tell you what God put on my heart. One day God's going to come along and is going to take you back to our homeland and restore our dream." For our people. But when I die, I'm going to die. I want you to, to t- promise me you will take my bones home to bury me. And that's where the story ends. It ends with a happy ending until you turn the page to the book of Exodus. Now, what you might not see, what you can't see, unless you read and understand Hebrew, is that the very first word in the book of Exodus is the word and, a conjunction. So it ends with this story and continues in the book of Exodus. It says, And these were the brothers of Joseph who lived in the land of Egypt. And this is their story. So it's one story. Genesis and Exodus are one story. And here's what happens. It takes a dark turn. I mean, after all this, you know, this this rise to the top, this happy ending, it says... After several years passed, a Pharaoh came along who did not remember Joseph. You read that line, you go, here we go again. And listen to what the text says. Now a king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we Come, let us deal shrewdly with them. Or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for the Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. The more they multiplied and the more they spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. Now get this, see this? Even in the midst of oppression, God is working on their behalf. 
growing them, multiplying them, developing them. God has continued to bless them. It says the Egyptians became ruthless, an imposing task on the Israelites, and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and every kind of field labor. They were slaves. And they were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. Now you're thinking, well, Dave, I came to church today. I didn't want to. Bummer, man. What a bummer. We had a happy ending. Why can't we just end on a happy ending? But the reality is this reaffirms a truth about life. That life comes together. And then life falls apart. And life will come together and life will fall apart. When I look across this room, I know many of your stories. I know some of you are in places where things are coming together. And I look around the room and I see people where things are coming apart. That's just the reality of life as we know it. And when we read the scripture, we also see in the biblical narrative it happens that way too. How things come together for God's people and then things fall apart. And then God invests God's self back in it and bring it all back together. And then things fall apart. The thing that makes me believe and have confidence in the scripture is its honesty and its truth. It does not back away from the reality of human suffering, and it takes it on and addresses it. The reality is that this is not a book. It's a library of book written over thousands of years. And one of the reasons that people sat down to write what they wrote that we have in this book, our holy book, the Scripture, is because they were wrestling with this question, why do people suffer? Why do people struggle? Why is there evil in the world? Why do things keep falling apart? And what's really interesting about the Bible is, is it's a conversation between these different authors over different times talking about why these things happen. And sometimes you don't even get the same answer. Read Proverbs, and Proverbs will tell you, live a good life, God will bless you, everything will be okay. If you do bad things, bad things will happen to you. And then you read Job and go, I don't think so. Then you read Ecclesiastes, says, there's just no purpose to anything except God. So the whole scripture is wrestling with this one issue. This is the truth. There will be suffering in our world. We know that. But the real question is, how will we respond to it? How will we show up in the world to respond to human suffering? And when we look at Scripture, we see how God keeps showing up again and again and again with His relentless, unconditional, steadfast love to bless people and to bless the world. In spite of what we do to ourselves, in spite of the mess that we make of things, God just keeps showing up. In fact, I think the real answer in Scripture is not an answer at all. The Bible really doesn't answer completely the question of why there is suffering. But what it does give us is a definitive, a definitive answer to suffering. The incarnation. A God who chose not to just give us an answer, but a God who chose to become one of us, to enter into human life, to become a human being, to feel what we feel, to know what we feel, to experience our life, to take your suffering and my suffering. This is the degree to which God loves our world and how God responded to human suffering, and it is our cue to how we are to respond to that as God's people, as his church, as the followers of Jesus Christ, that we are called to invest our lives, to get involved, to not sit on the sidelines, to not become cynical. You know what, church? We, we cannot fall into the trap 
that we see being laid every day in our world. It's an us versus them world. It's not an us versus them's world. That's the devil's lie. Because there is no them. It's an all us or nothing. When God looks at our world, he sees us, not them. And the church of Jesus Christ better not fall into the evil and the sinfulness of living into that polarization and hate and demonizing people that we disagree with. Because it's all us. And we're called to be bearers of light and goodness in this world. In fact, when we talk about human suffering and struggle to some degree, it's about us. But to some degree, it's not. Because when you read Scripture and you look at this story, who are the people in the story? They are slaves. They're the left out. They're the forgotten, the oppressed, the marginalized. And over and over again in Scripture, we see God's special favor and love for the widow and for the orphan. Isaiah 41, 17 says, The poor needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched and thirst, but I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. Life will fall apart. Life will come together, and it will fall apart again. And there is suffering in our world, and what counts is how we show up and how we respond. And this is amazing to me, powerful, when you see what God does now in this situation here when they're slaves. God uses, in this story, God uses women to then deliver the people. Midwives, two women, refused to obey the order of Pharaoh to kill every newborn baby boy. They refuse. They save the Jewish people. This allows a little baby to be born by the name of Mo, who would be named Moses. We see a Levite woman who now plays a role in the story. She gives birth to a little baby boy, and she puts him in a little pitch basket and lays him in the Nile between the reeds. By the way, that little pitch basket that we're talking about the word used there in Hebrew is the same word used when describing the ark. God used the ark to save the people. Now God uses a, bas to a basket to save the people. You see what God's will God will use anything and everything and anyone and everyone to bring redemption to the world. And a little baby boy. And then the most ironic, this is the most ironic thing in the whole story. Once you see this, you can't unsee it. Who does God use? Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, you almost have to laugh about it. He's trying to put an end to them, and God uses his own daughter to bring the one that would deliver them into his own home. And he would educate the future deliverer. Do you see how life falls apart, life comes back together, and God steps in Again and again and again, because God is a God of unfailing love, and God is relentless. And see, for you and me, this is not optimism. Optimism is too weak a word. It's hope. It's trust. It's refusing to be people who fall into the cynicism and bitterness and resentment that is poisoning our planet and to being people of light and truth and beauty and goodness because as a song earlier this is our father's world this is our god's world and we all have a part to play in it. We'll never see the ending. We'll never see the finish. We're just called to water seeds. And what is the purpose of this Bible? The purpose of this Bible is to remind us, not just of our history, but of who God is and who we are called to be and what we're called to do and how God is at work and how God has called us to a task. Now, I tell you, when I was writing this message, God put a word on my heart what is it that we're supposed to be doing as a church right now? Maybe we're just supposed to be midwives. 
Come on now, you know where I'm going with this? Because some of you are pretty old. Some of us, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we're called to be midwives, to help give birth to a new generation, to rescue our children and youth from a toxic planet, and to put them in the basket of this church so that we can launch them out into the world as God's people to bring hope and love and goodness as lawyers and doctors and nurses and teachers who will bring life and goodness to the world. I'm so encouraged our, our young people, our students just got back with, from spending a whole week exploring poverty and racism and have come back excited and, and hopeful. We are their midwives. I read this prayer. That's enough, isn't it? I've gone on and on long enough, Barbara said. No, she didn't say that. I just want to say this. I love all of you. And it is, it is such an honor to be your pastor. And I look at it and I see how sincere and genuine you are in your desire to serve and to love and to give. And it makes me want to be a better man and a better follower of Jesus and a better husband. We've got work to do. Here's a prayer. This prayer was written, and I'll use this as my closer, written in honor of Oscar Romero. Oscar Romero was a Catholic priest in El Salvador who fought for the poor. He was executed assassinated in the middle of Mass while holding up the host. This prayer was written in 1979 before he was murdered. I think it's a good prayer. It helps now and then, it's in your program, it helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces effects far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is the beginning of a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and to do the rest. We may never see the end results. But that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders. Ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future that is not our own. Amen.